Okay, everyone, we'll get Your started today. Connected. All right, um, so welcome. I'm going to go back to university ostensibly to get a degree so I could teach um, paramedics, but also with the outside chance I might get into medicine. And with a, a change to a new to a university, a change of town meant a change of barber, and suddenly uh, on my first time going to this uh, new barber, I remember sitting down in the chair and uh, at the end of the haircut, he pulled out the straight razor. And for the first time in an instance, I was having palpitations and right back in the scene of the very first job I did after I uh, um, graduated, uh, like the very first shift, first job, phone rang as soon as we started our shift and it was a, a woman who uh, had slit her throat, slashed her wrists, and I remember still vividly everything about that job, her lying in the waterbed, the blood congealed around her, all over the room. And in particular, that her, her daughter who was there who, who called 99911. But as I was leaving, looking on the on the counter and seeing this on the, dr the dresser, this um, green handled straight razor, and thinking how painful that must have been. And I can guarantee you that in the five years since that job, I never thought about it again, even once. It wasn't something that I had nightmares about, never thought about, but it just sort of was right back there with that. And because my old barber never used a straight razor, um, so. It was interesting, and I went, oh, that's sort of an interesting thing. I did what I think everyone or a lot of people do and probably shouldn't do, ignored it, um, went on with my, my life and my career, and after uh, a four-year degree in exposure therapy of a haircut every three weeks, uh, I managed to get through it and, and was fine. I look straight grazes now and have, have no difficulties. But looking back at it, that was probably one of the first times where I sort of realized that, yeah, there were issues I had, and I hadn't ever addressed them and paid attention to them. From there, I went into, into medicine, and definitely there are, are moments from that. Um, there's the, the everyday things, and I think this is the sort of the thousand cuts kind of thing, but uh, as an intensivist, dealing with death and dying, baking, breaking bad news, um, routinely in an ICU, you know, watching a, a partners lose the love of their life at the end of a, of, a, of a long relationship together. And those little things, I think, all add up with, uh, with over time. Uh, there were, then there were the bigger things. Uh, I was involved in the response to SARS and, and being the type of person I was volunteered to actually go into the hospital and, and work on the SARS unit and then involved in the investigation team when many of my colleagues unfortunately decided to, to stay home. Uh, and to this day, I sort of still remember the moment I was outside of a, a, a cubicle in Toronto General Hospital when uh, the, uh, I was just about to go in and see another possible SARS patient and my colleague, Mike Cardam, came down and told me that our colleagues at, at Mount Sinai, the hospital I eventually worked at, and my friends became, were just admitted with, with um, illness, and this unknown illness at the time, and wearing the exact same PPP I was wearing, about to go in there. And the, the months that ensued with um, you know, going home, not being able to touch your, your spouse, being socially isolated both at home and at work, always keeping three meters apart, even when we ate, and, uh, and wearing a mask all day long and to this day there's a type of 3M mask that I put on and the smell of it I instantly can remember like being back in that on bars and whatnot and so there's these things that, that accumulate. And then when I do this talk a lot of people think oh well you're in the military you know that must be the reason why you know, you know you've had different uh, stresses in your life and, and it's actually sometimes the obvious isn't despite you know deploying to Haiti after the earthquake and uh, and tours in, not in Afghanistan and IEDs blowing up our base and stuff like that. I think, you know, I actually, um, the, the systems and processes that were in place at the time, things that I initially poo-pooed, like our decompression period and stuff as we're coming back from tour, which I now think are the most important things that we could ever have done, um, I think they made, did make a difference and, and they helped. But, uh, you know, it's not the same for everybody. I think one of the most interesting things was when I was just prior to this uh, doing that test, I'd had this role as an executive in a hospital. I'd been brought in to help uh, a system that was having a lot of quality issues, and I was uh, you know, dealing with you know, things that I never thought still occurred in Canadian healthcare system, wrong not only site surgeries, but wrong patient surgeries, uh, surgeon literally stacking up bodies like cordwood having to review 3,000 cases of a radiologist who is practicing past his prime and missing brain 
uh, tumors and things like that. So, and then having to address each of these and apologize to the families and go to the families with these and, and all that stuff. And I would, you know, used to think that going to an administrative precision, even though it's sort of half clinical, half administrative, would have been much easier. But actually, it was probably far harder than the job I did. And I think uh, this in part reminded me that you know, every contract leaves a trace, but now it wasn't just my individual exposures that it was the summing up of everything in sort of the, in this large hospital system. And this actually, I think, uh, relates a lot to what people in dispatch control face as well, and other people in leadership in leadership roles, that a lot of times we think, oh, you're distant from the patient, so you don't have the same impact, you don't have the same contact. But actually, one of the things we do know about is, is an issue with a lot of this is around control, and a sense of whether you control things or not. And when I'm practicing as the consultant and intensivist in the ICU, and I'm setting up my team, and and putting layers of safe patient safety and protection in place to either prevent or mitigate incidents. I have control over those incidents and can, can prevent them and can and have an action. But when it's when you're not directly involved, um, use that control. And I think this made me sort of have a greater appreciation. Certainly, like I said, um, we see this in, in UK and London, where those that are in control and and are distant from it, but sit there on the phone and listen to these things that and this can definitely you know, have an impact, and we need to appreciate that sometimes think, more than we do for our leaders and, and for people that aren't. Just because you're not immediately patient-facing doesn't mean that this can't, uh, can't have an impact on you. So that was sort of the, the story, and then ran off to the UK, uh, and this is where the out of the fire and into the frying pan bit comes in. Because going from a, a job that was already somewhat stressful to, to easily the most demanding training period of my life inside or outside of the military, in a, in a team which is truly uh, getting to the professional uh, sports Olympic level, like, literally we work with the uh, GB Sports, the UK Olympic team. They send their coaches in to learn from us. We learn from them. Um, and the demand, the clinical governance, the questioning of, of what you do every day, the, the expectation for performing, um, the violence we see on a daily basis. There's rarely a day that goes by that I don't um, deal with the death and the number of people that we see right now, you know, the knife crime, which is just insane, and, and children uh, being stabbed constantly, throw into that uh, um, being the first responder, first uh, medical team on the bridge at London Bridge and caught up in the middle of that. It's, uh, these things, you know, certainly take a toll, and you think that, that these can have a, you know, you're just crazy. You're going into something that's even, even worse off than you, you were before. Then there are once in a career kind of jobs that come along, and uh, and this was was I thought definitely one of them. A uh, unfortunate uh, boy who was mauled and killed by a dog. Father there doing CPR when we arrive, and and all those sort of horrific things. And uh, and they definitely um, uh, have an impact. Uh, but I actually you know sort of got this without too much. And then six weeks later um, had this. Hello. Hello, Tony. I've got a job for you. Um, it's coming through as a dog attack on two children. Um, they're saying both dead. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Is anyone else going? Very nice job for you. Uh, yes, there's a crew, an RV, an officer, and another crew. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So just after you have a, a once-in-a-lifetime, you think, career, bizarre job, to have that job dropped on you. That was Tony, the, my critical care paramedic who was working with me as we were getting dispatched on this job. And it was, this job is every horror that you could imagine. Um, an infant, severe facial trauma, difficult airway, another brother, mother, dog, and then the whole layers of family, things that happen afterwards and, and seeing what happened to this family that subsequently gets torn apart by this whole incident, um, definitely do sting. And at the time, um, I was uh, living in the UK, and and this was uh, trying to be culturally sensitive and, and integrate. I became a little addicted to X Factor at the time, and this was the uh, sponsor, Talk Talk, and this was played. And this job happened around this time of year, sort of in the fall. 
and this was played at the beginning and end of every commercial break, and would come on the screen just like that, that sort of loud noise and, and whatnot. It always startled me um, after this job, and it, it took me through the whole season before I stopped seeing that infant's face in, in this sort of infant's face here. Um, and that uh, uh, was definitely a, you know, a, a period sort of to get through. So after all that, you must think, you know, God, this guy is definitely crispy now if you're able to see me on video and wondering if there's little smoke cinders coming off me and stuff. But the reality is when I, when I redo the score now, I actually am at almost the bottom of the scale. And that, for me, was really interesting. And a lot of this came about because of um, a medical student uh, at the time who was on that job with me. And he's the one that really spurred this talk and this whole journey and the documentaries and other things that we've made. And uh, so we'll get uh, some words from him in the moment. But I think uh, this is, you know, why I think it's important to share this. And this is Matt Walton, that's a picture of me, but uh, Matt will speak in a minute. And, uh, and I want you to hear from Matt's perspective, his take on this, and then understand what led me down this road with, uh, um, with speaking about this and, and being willing to share stories like this. My name is Matthew Walton. I'm now a qualified doctor, but at the time of this incident I was a medical student observing Mike and the paramedic Tony, and I thought it would be useful to give some honest insight into the way I felt at the time and the psychological process that I went through afterwards. When the call came in, I'd obviously never experienced anything like that before. I had no real insight into what I was about to see, and it was quite scary, to be honest. Um, I told Dr. Mike that I'd never experienced anything like this before, and then we went off. When we actually got there, everything obviously happened very fast, and I think the main thing I took away from it was just observing the faces of the child and getting a real vivid snapshot of those images in my mind and the stress of the situation. When we got back, the paramedic Tony suggested that we debriefed. I thought that was really helpful for me because it let me put my mental images into a bigger timeline of the overall event and let me defocus away from them. And it also just let me know what was going on because it's, it's hard to get a good picture of, of everything if you're just one person. Then Mike um, asked me how I was. Um, I think I told him that I was feeling quite sad, um, and he just reassured me that that was completely normal, which is really helpful to know. Um, and then I think I had one more debrief the following day with my um, placement director, and then I moved on to another placement. The following week I had quite a few flashbacks to the situation. Um, when I was waking up in the morning, it was one of the first things I thought about. And, for example, going into Sainsbury's in the shops, uh, I'd remember it. Um, when I see another child or a dog, there were some horrible videos on Facebook that reminded me of it. And um, after that, I think I had one notable incident where I ended up crying in my car, and that was about a month and a half later when I remembered it again. Um, and I'd sort of not really wanted to think about it, and then it all kind of came out then. Um, and then when I was at home at Christmas with my nieces, again, being with family that's young, reminded me of it. It was, however, an absolute privilege to be able to watch the performance by Mike and Tony where Mike was giving out excellent commands. They were completely calm, situationally aware. Tony had an unbelievable bandwidth where he could hear the dog barking, whereas, for example, I couldn't. Um, and the pilot did an amazing job um, landing, so it hasn't put me off so far, and I still want to continue in this line of work. So it was actually Matt's sort of real interest in some things that happened after this that uh, brought us back together and, and sort of spurred all of us and Matt's ongoing interest in, in this topic and the need to, to start to share some of this with others so that we start conversations and, and we begin to, uh, to address these topics and help people so that they um, can have a long and healthy career uh, and not be, um, and not you know, have it limited by things like this. I don't have to. I think this this 
people in this room and on the on the video conference here, and particularly in Canada, are very aware uh, of the issue and and that it's on the people's radar. I think back in the UK, I just sort of want you to know that you're not alone. This is not a, a uniquely Canadian thing. This is something that we see there as well. And uh, and Russell, who's on the right side of the screen, this is actually from the paper just um, it's a day two days ago now. Um, but the inquest is just on into his tragic death this summer. And he was had been a technician in the ambulance service for quite a while, and then and then took his life. And um, and this is somebody who had spent a lot of his time actually working with um, people on uh, on helplines and stuff for other topics, and had been a, a, a um, special police officer in the Met for quite a while. And he, it, you know, it's it, his story and how he ended up here is, is I think, in, uh, in sort of a failure of of our system. Uh, in many ways. And this is not just in the pre-hospital setting. Um, I think critical care clinicians in, in general, uh, doctors, nurses, have high rates of this. There's, there's no shortage of this in the media in the UK and, and certainly in, in Canada as well. And again, I think a lot of this comes down to this, this issue of, of caring professions, the type of people we select for these roles and, and, and what, we, what we experience. Um, and there's, there's lots of data just to, to, to talk about this. One of the things that really spurred me on was thinking about Matt, but also information out there about the generations to come and, and those who are going to be you know, looking after me and others down the road. And you know, we're already seeing significant rates of increased rising mental health conditions and mental health seeking behavior, which in many ways is a good thing, but also you know, makes me think you know, we really have to do better for those that come after us so that uh, we can help them uh, through this. So thinking about, so what is it in terms of the lessons that I've learned from HEMS and resiliency and, and, and some of the things that have sort of helped me get through these things now and, and have a, I think, a healthier balance of perspective on this than I, certainly where I was, you know, in 2016. Um, one of them, and, and Matt mentioned these, are our routine debriefs, and these aren't psychologically focused debriefs at all. These are our debriefs, part of our, our usual clinical performance and that we do after every job. We do a hot debrief with the team and then a, a debrief amongst the, the HEMS team itself. So with hot debrief with everyone who is on scene and then, um, uh, or at least as many people as we can if we end up at hospital and, uh, and then amongst our own team. And these are really focused on how we can continue to improve our performance, our clinical skills and whatnot. But I think they do have a knock on, on benefit for people like Matt, but also I, I remember, I think, where this became most obvious to me was a, a job a few months ago where, it, unfortunately, a, a young man had stabbed himself in the chest. And we arrived. Uh, he was in arrest. We did a thoracotomy, stitched his heart up, did all that we could to try and resuscitate him. But the timings were just a little too long. And, um, and we, he, we eventually, unfortunately, pronounced him on scene. We did the debrief afterwards. And, and at the end of the debrief, our usual sort of go-around debrief, uh, uh, what happened, and, and just like in the in medicine, uh, when you're doing outpatient medicine, they have this thing about the, the door handle question. So just as your hands on the door, you're about to leave with the doctor. That's when the the important question really comes out. And this young police officer who was on scene, just as we're wrapping up the debrief and literally getting ready to walk away, says he has a question and asks whether or not he made things worse for this patient, because when they arrived, um, the patient was peri arrest. He was hypovolemic, hypoxic, he was agitated. The paramedics on scene were trying to get his clothes off, get IV access, and the police officers were helping to hold him um, so they could do this. And then he arrested as they were doing that. And he, I'm sure, after just witnessing his very first thoracotomy ever and, and, a, and a horrific scene, was then walking away with this self-doubt that what he had done may have made things worse. And the ability to say to him just in that moment, no, absolutely not. You know, you gave this person every chance you could do to, to get better and, and help him, I think probably made a difference for how he was going to process that event and the direction he could have gone from that. So although not focused on sort of psychology and things, just, you know, simple facts and, and, and addressing answers and questions, I think, can be an issue and it can be a benefit. Uh, we do death and disability rounds twice a week, so this is... Certainly a good and a bad. When I first went there, it's the highest level of clinical governance I've ever faced in my, in my life, where literally we walked through uh, not all the jobs because they're too busy, but a random selection and certainly 
uh, higher priority jobs. And you, as a team, get questioned about every decision you make and as you go through this. And it's a, it's a learning process, but it's also a, for those that were there, but also a way to share this learning with everyone else who's in the room, with your peers that are around you, um, who didn't do the job, to think about, well, what would they have done and learn from your experience. That's how our knowledge gets spread. But it can definitely be difficult. I remember after the, the, the first dog attack, one I showed, I went, we had D&D &D rounds on that, and the, uh, lead, uh, the governance lead who was leading it, a uh, friend of mine now, he just kept on pressing me during the, uh, during the thing about my decision to, to fly this kid to a, um, to a trauma center, <clears throat> and as opposed to going to the local community hospital, which is really sort of a, not, a not much around the corner, and uh, he pushed me and pushed me and pushed me, and I was, I was quite angry at at the time, because I was like, I thought I'd be getting support here, and and you know, anybody who knows, you know, this was the, in my mind, the right decision. And then afterwards, we're in the hangar, and he comes up to me and he, he says, you know, I, I would have done the exact same thing, but I needed to make sure that that you knew in your mind it was the right thing to do. And I think there's something in that, in that although it challenges you and it makes you think about it, that understanding and your own confidence, that you did the right thing, you did the best in that moment with what you had, makes a difference after these events. Certainly our simulation and training that we go through um, to experience these and practice this so we have a muscle memory, the way we know our kit, the way we know um, the things uh, and our procedures and, and whatnot is uh, it helps protect you and gives you more bandwidth for processing. I think there is something about our model of a, of a multidisciplinary team that, uh, that has an impact and maybe I can talk more about this at, um, at uh, uh, trauma rounds on, on Monday. But I think there is something about two different um, people in different professions working together on this, what we both bring to it and what we take away from it um, in terms of how that relationship is and, and the bond that's so strong. And, and I think there's also a sense in there of control and the ability to, to really bring um, all that is possible to bear to, uh, to help a person and a sense for both the doctor and the paramedic that we've done that um, for this patient uh, as opposed to some uh, of the other restrictions that could be in place. Uh, it's been certainly an amazingly supportive workplace and colleagues, and also this, this work-life balance, which is very emphasized there, although we don't always listen to the <laughs> advice. Um, so from this, turns out Matt isn't just a brilliant medical student, an amazing uh, you know, junior doctor, but he's also an award-winning documentary filmmaker. And so he was really spurred on by that episode, and, and also, in particular, the fact that uh, what we have in place and how we handle this and how we'd gone through all of medical school and never heard anything about this in his entire training or, or how to deal with these things. So um, with zero budget and just Matt's talents, we went and made um, uh, first a, a one documentary about the, uh, based upon the incidents, not for patient confidentiality reasons. We didn't film it with the exact details or anything, but based on the incident. And, and then he's gone on to make a subsequent. And this had received a quite wide attention in both the, the media and whatnot internationally and ended up um, the patron for our charity this year is Prince William and as you know this has been a, you may know it's been a passion of his so got to have an amazing 20 minute closed door conversation with, um, with the Prince about this and his issues and, and uh, um, how we can advance this together and we're just about to do some work with one of the, or we've just completed some work it's about to be launched in November with one of the Prince's other trusts um, Child Bereavement UK on a uh, training um, uh, module and um, program for pre-hospital care on dealing with bereavement, um, both supporting those on scene as well as our issues our, ourselves in, in dealing with this. Um, so it's really some interesting things that that will be coming out at the end of November. There will be a bunch of media and that will be available. So just in the last couple of minutes, my completely relatively armchair thoughts and comments more from my own personal views, but uh, um, so I don't, I'm not purporting to be a, an expert on, on these things, but uh, what I think are sort of some of the key things for resilience. So one is, I think, strength, but it's understanding that strength, because certainly early in my career, I thought about strength for these things as being an impenetrable wall that I wouldn't let these things ever touch me. You know, I was rock solid, especially, you know, military doctor, all these things, you know, nothing's going to hurt me. And I've learned over time that that isn't the type of strength we're talking about and you need to, to defend yourself against these because eventually something will, will push through that wall or will knock it over. 
um, but it's really about resilience. And resilience, when you look at the definition, is about the capacity to recover and the toughness to get through something and the ability to spring back to shape afterwards. It doesn't mean you don't bend at times. It doesn't mean you don't feel the effects of the wind or other forces uh, on you. And the, uh, the mental health charity in the UK, MIND, describes resilience as you know, not simply a person's ability to bounce back, but their, cap their capacity to adapt in the face of challenging circumstances whilst maintaining a stable and mental well-being. I think we talk about that a lot, a lot more in our team now and at work about you know, how do we, we prepare our clinical skills, we prepare you know, our bandwidth and things like that, but how do we also make sure we're physically prepared as well as mentally prepared to be able to deliver in the job and the roles that, that we have to do. I think awareness is a key issue and, and just you know, doing things like this and having it on your radar because it certainly wasn't on my radar. And I think I hopefully caught it in time before, um, before it was a, a big issue, but it's, it's that understanding and, and awareness of what happens. Um, I think failure is important. We, I think in society, and I think this is one of the issues that it comes up in some of the literature around potentially why the younger generations are, are facing more challenges with this with the social media age and Facebook and all these things and their views of an understanding of the world around them is that we often only see people's successes and certainly, you know, I'm a victim of this. I look at my mentors, some of whom are incredibly amazing, successful people in the world that I'm privileged to have as, as friends and mentors and every time I look at them I go, God, I don't know how they do it. Like, you know, they, they're always so successful in, in massive grants and, you know, great executive jobs and things like that, and, and I, I forget that, you know, that we don't share enough our failures, and there's this thing called a, a failure CV, which uh, uh, a lot more of us talk about now, and it's sharing our failures as well as our successes with people. Uh, the grants you don't get, the jobs you don't get, the, the times you're, you're not the best person you'd, you'd hope to be, the, uh, the ability to, um, uh, you know, the, the things that don't always go right so that people understand, because I think it's through failure that you build resilience. Um, if you have only successes in life and everything goes swimmingly, I don't think you actually ever have the opportunity to develop the skills you need to, to cope and adapt and to, and to develop. So, um, and as I, I've lived a long time now for Winston, Winston Churchill's quote, the success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. And I think that's one of the, the key messages for me in this. Self-reflection, just thinking about what are the things that do this and what, how is it impacting you in moment to moment, day to day. Um, I think one of the things that I wasn't as good at is recognizing, uh, you know, when things are sort of are wearing on me a bit, when I'm too tired, when I'm, I'm having, you know, a job has had an impact that I, because I don't always, it's, it's difficult sometimes to in the moments, especially when you see so many things day to day, recognize something's had an impact on you, especially when it's the small little things as opposed to the sort of the big overwhelming ones. In the military, one of the things they do as a flight surgeon and as a pilot, and when they put you in something called a hypoxia chamber. In a hypoxia chamber, they take up the altitude and you uh, experience hypoxia, and you note know the symptoms you have when you experience hypoxia. Your brain's not working as well, and, and you get these various symptoms. But there's a myriad of symptoms that can occur. One of the things that's interesting is that it's, it's for that individual, the symptoms that you have are, are usually reproducible. So it's learning what your symptoms are of this, because not everyone has all of these and, and all of them be different. But for me, I know it's, it's I look at the people around me, it's when I, I, I get a little short and maybe bark at somebody in the, at the hospital or something like that, things that shouldn't be doing, and, and I know civility saves lives, so something I, I try to avoid. Uh, certainly at home, when I'm, I'm just a little bit more distracted, grumpy or things like that, those are the things I know. It's like, oh, wait a minute, um, maybe I need to look at how my mental hygiene is at the moment, what's happening, and that's, you know, maybe that job the other day or that issue is still bugging me and I need to or, or take a little bit of break, take care of myself a bit more, get a little more rest, because you need to recognize that the downsides of what happened if you don't take care of these things, and, uh, and but these are all in, entirely avoidable and preventable if you, if you do um, take good care of yourself and, and others around you. So, Vulnerability, I think this is the last one that comes to this whole slide. So uh, Neil Greenberg started a program called TRIM, which is used in the UK military and is now developing healthcare thing. He's based in London with us. And he has a, a quote that says, resilience may not lie within individuals, but between individuals. And I think that's really important because it's not just about things you have to do on your own. Um, it's a willingness to be open and to share. 
And uh, certainly for me, ever talking about this was uh, was something that was uh, not the thing I'd like to be doing. I'd much rather be discussing, you know, some hardcore medical topic or something. But the willingness to also to think accept support from others, which is even harder for a lot of people to do, um, if necessary. And and when people say, you know, how are you doing? Answer honestly, as opposed to just saying the usual, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, there's uh, so that's sort of for the for the individual. There's uh, professor Williams, who's an eminent um, uh, professor of psychiatry in the UK and is working with us in the, in the faculty of pre-hospital um, care, his uh, background initially was around mental health issues, around disasters and stuff, but has moved much more to the day-to-day -day now. And I've had a, a chance in working on some collaborations with him, and, and he talks about something I find quite interesting, primary versus secondary stressors. And this came out of his work in trying to understand, well, why are some people at the same major incidents uh, affected by something and others not. Because they, their primary stressor is the same for all those people. Um, but he said he thinks, and it's not the only thing, but one of the things that he thinks has a, plays a big role in this are the issues around secondary stressors that occur in different people's lives. So it's, even though they had uh, two individuals had the same stressor, one individual may also be having the challenges at home or some other stress life, uh, some other stress in their life, difficulty for or you know, the environment, the culture in which you're, in your, you're living. And that's led him to talk a lot about the moral architecture of organizations and what organizations can do to help support their employees and, and prevent and protect their mental health. So it's all these things around the individual. And a lot of them, although, and especially as a leader in the field, and, well, trying to be a leader in the field, um, to a degree that I, you know, look at, teams and things and think, well, how do I help people? And because you can't necessarily change the primary stressor. You can't, we, you know, someone has to go to that job. Someone has to go take care of that person who's been stabbed or injured or that major incident. And, and while it would be nice to do that, you know, the reality is that, that that's what we're there to do. But what we can affect is the secondary stressors as an organization and those other things that might be the contributing factors because many of them do fall in the domain of work and, and, and the ability to, to alter those. And that, they play a key role in people having uh, how they respond to these stressor events is where we can focus our attention and energy. So he talks about uh, how organizations need to develop a moral architecture and align their vision and culture and priorities with their, their values and, and whatnot. And, and his proposition that it's difficult for healthcare staff and organizations to continue to provide compassionate care and uh, be the evidence and, and whatnot if, if that's not the way they are also treated and managed within the organization. So this need to, to, to look at how, and one of my particular interests around leadership is how different models of leadership can, can affect not only the performance of the organization, but indirectly through things like this, um, get the most out of, out of the people in your team. He has a whole list of reasons why it's important for organizations to do this, and you, know, you can read these, but I think it's it, it, most of them are, are obvious. But for, you know, that, that people will be compassionate if you treat them with compassion themselves. It helps decrease errors. It improves quality. There's a whole whole list of them that go along that way. And there's an excellent article by the um, by Mayo Clinic Proceedings of, of Mayo Clinic, but Mayo Clinic themselves that write about their experiences, although this is physician-based, I think it's translatable to any clinical professional, but their experience in trying to improve physician well-being. And, uh, it really clearly articulates the business case for this and why they do it in a, in a private sort of healthcare system in the U.S. in this way it saves them money and impacts patient care and, and whatnot. Um, but it also talks about the evidence base they've developed in terms of how they do this with their teams because this is actually describing their own internal um, process for, for doing this and certainly worth a read. And uh, um, Professor Williams has some other reports and things that they've worked on as well and used more in the NHS in terms of how um, organizations and leadership can, can impact this. For the individual, and I apologize, they don't have Canadian references, but these are UK references in a number of organizations. So the Heads Together is the Prince's Trust um, work on mental health. We have MIND, which is the mental health organization in the UK, has actually a specific blue light program, or what we call blue light responders. Those are all of our 
uh, well, I guess they're blue lights now in some parts of Canada again, <laughs> but uh, um, they're, uh, you know, it's all police, fire, EMS, volunteers uh, that, uh, that can access this, and it's specifically targeted helplines for them and for their, for their families to support uh, issues around this, and MedTrim is the, is the evolution of, of trim from the military for medicine. So I think I'll, I'll leave Matt to have a few final words, and then after some questions, if people want to stick around, we can, we can watch, the, watch the videos. I'm now going to talk about some of the positives that came out of this situation in terms of looking after me as a medical student and what the team did really well. Um, importantly, I was made to feel like what I was going through was very normal and that was because Dr. Mike had and explained to me right from the very start what he thought would happen and that turned out to be almost exactly right. Back to me, I did have flashbacks. We don't really have formal training at medical school about this, which I think is quite a problem, um, because it led to me feeling very scared and isolated on my own, not knowing whether I was losing my own sanity, not knowing if I really had it in me to do this line of work if I was so badly affected. But ultimately, I've learned that if you're not affected by these things, then you're not really human. But I wouldn't have known that unless Mike had have told me. And I could also share this with my other student, who'd also experienced some really difficult cases that I think would have been in the repertoire of normal for an air ambulance team, such as just a cardiac arrest or um, a suicide. And all of these things equally shocked her, even though they didn't make it into the news. But with that simple bit of education, I think we were both made to feel a lot more reassured and comforted through this time. Because I can imagine a lot of observers feel like they need to show a brave face or that they can't really talk to senior doctors because they're too senior. So it's really important to bridge that, that gap. One more thing that Mike did that was absolutely fantastic was to check up on me three months later, which was a long time, but I was still thinking about the event and it still did cross my mind. And to have someone else to talk to about it who was there, who knew what it was like and who had a lot of experience to advise what to do in these situations just to check whether what was going on with me was normal or did I need any extra help. And luckily I didn't, um, and it was incredibly reassuring to be able to have someone to talk to. I saw in the D&D meetings some experienced senior doctors talking about how vulnerable they felt and how out of control they felt in situations. And again, that's a really good example of showing to us that, in fact, even though we look up to these people, they equally feel similar to the way that we do, even when they're at such an amazing level, performing so incredibly. And it's really, again, important to share those kind of feelings with the younger students. I still don't feel like we're sharing enough. Um, Tony, the paramedic, hadn't even talked to anyone about his nightmares and his experience with it and I haven't talked to him and if we had have both connected with each other I think that would have been a big source of comfort for both of us um, and we only found that out when we both spoke at a conference together about this. So my top three points would be to tell students about the traumatic process in debriefs as part of just a routine, tell them what it's like, check up on the students afterwards. It might be really trivial to the professionals, it might be just another cardiac arrest or part of your normal repertoire, but it's not to us. For some of us, it's the first time we've ever seen anything like this. And share your own experiences with others openly. We all look up to professionals like you. We think that you're all heroes, but you have to show us that heroes are also human and that it's okay to be human. So I think I'll stop there for any questions. Yeah, um, thank you very much. You um, yeah, so I guess uh, we'll open it up to two questions. I think one of the values, it's Ron from Vancouver. One of the valuable things that's come up with us a long time ago is called Buffer Talk. I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that it's encouraged as much as it should be, but it's huge. And I, I love, so I spend a lot of my time in hospitals with paramedics right now trying to find out what's going on. And then I'll get sold or confronted in an ambulance and say, can I talk to you about a call? And I love this because one, it provides me with some insight of what's going on, but also it gives them a chance to vent 
And I don't know that we do that enough, and I don't know that that's value a lot. I, but I think most paramedics in, in, in no way try and make somebody feel inappropriate if they want to disclose the concern they have with the call. So that's sort of a little bit about this, but it helps to use it more recently, uh, sooner. We've heard before that, you know, that the best way to deal with critical incident stress is to deal with it right now. That if you delay it, it's harder to impact your, the benefits of it. I don't know how true that is. I think any time is of value, but the time is, is soon better than later. Yeah, I think, and again, the literature is still wide open on this. I think we're just at the early phase of learning a lot of this. My um, good friend and colleague has actually just become the head of the uh, um, it's the Canadian Institute for, I think, post-traumatic stress disorder that the government has just funded in, in, in Ottawa and looking at primarily first responders and, and the military. And there's so much research to do in this area and to understand. I think one of the things, and like everything in medicine, I don't think there's a single answer. Um, everybody, different things are right for different people. Uh, I think there's some benefit to, uh, to ensuring for sure that people are open and willing to talk and having the opportunities they want to. I think addressing some of the things with debriefs just around the factual issues of, of you know, answering questions and allowing people an opportunity to, to get, you know, to, to sort something out in their mind and, and clarify an issue is, is really important and beneficial. Uh, we can talk maybe a little bit on Tuesday, I think there's, uh, at the trauma rounds, I think there's, there's an issue around um, in the pre-hospital world, certainly in, in Canada, and, uh, and know more about the Ontario setting than here, but around um, professional regulation of, of, of uh, paramedics and how to have, how to, you know, I think the importance of, of uh, professional governance to separate out employment from safety issues and quality issues so you can actually have those conversations without the two being all intermingled makes it have a huge potential impact and benefit on, on allowing conversations like this to, uh, to occur more easily. But um, yeah, I think all those things are, are important in, uh, in allowing um, and helping people through these things. But I don't know the, the single right answer. And the other one is patient confidentiality. I, my wife's a high-end nurse. And I talked to her about all these proper discussions. She you can't say that. That's patient confidentiality. I actually talk about that out loud. And I say, hey, my career depended on that. That's how I deal with all this stress. Oh, that wouldn't be accepted now. So that also makes you think about this. Yeah, I think you can you can talk about these jobs without necessarily having to to disclose confidential patient information. You know, if you some of them are hard because they're they're high profile, they're in the media anyways, and it's and it's it's already out there. But uh, you know, you can talk about your experience with the job and what you went through as opposed to necessarily the clinical details or the patient identifiers in, in a in a job and, and you know, not breach those issues. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the other sites or online at all? I think someone needs to mute their mic. Um, I have a question, yep. uh, Mike. So uh, great presentation! I think our best yet <laughs> of all the the rounds we've had. So thank you very much for your for your it's time today. Um, so uh, within BCEHS itself, um, I think the opiate crisis and a number of different reasons has uh, led this topic to be an important focus for us. Um, so we have, there's the reactive helplines that you can debrief after the call, uh, or after the incident, I should say. Um, we've also, uh, we've got a team that's developed a resilience course that I would say is more proactive in nature. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on, I guess, the London Ambulance Service um, there was a couple of like, the heads together and the organizations you had, had mentioned, but specifically within the service from post-incident briefing, um, are there any courses or other means of addressing the topic uh, yeah, so I think, before things happen? Yeah, so I think there's uh, a number of things. There's a bunch of, so within London Air Ambulance, which is its own sort of separate group from London Ambulance Service, um, but is a sort of a, a related arm um, but separate. Uh, we have, at the moment, we have any proactive training, but that's what we've just developed with the uh, um, Sean Breedman UK, which is about to launch as a whole course uh, mm. around this for that has uh, both in-person and online components. So that is uh, that's the first sort of formal going forward training course we're doing. Uh, we've 
it's, we've looked at a lot of the other courses out there, and it's hard to find something that uh, that necessarily fits for everybody. So we haven't, uh, um, you know, we haven't gone with Mentrim or some of the others. Uh, it's more the approach that's been taken over the years, and a lot of those things that have been built into the system. Do London Ambulance Service, and I think the the ambulance services in the UK are actually, I'd say, further behind than here in Canada at addressing these issues, and um, unfortunately, and uh, and they're still just starting to come to terms with them. Um, so it, it, there's not, uh, there's some, they, they do do, um, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's a, there's other sort of broader issues. It's in many services is more of a, an administrative checkbox than a actual, you know, delivery of, 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 you know, care to the team kind of thing. And I think they need to explore more of the leadership issues and culture issues and pre-hospital care in the UK that they're, they're mm. working to move beyond, but I think the inquest into Russell's death may start to highlight some of those issues. And follow-up question to that is it seems that the uh, junior doctor got a lot of benefit out of a text message after the fact, mm -hmm. um, which seemed to be maybe a mentorship relationship. Do you think there's any role for formalizing a mentorship relationship as a someone mm -hmm. uh, trustworthy that someone can go to um, yeah, I think as a mechanism? Yeah to deal with these things as a service? Yeah, it certainly is. Services, these are one of the things that we have I'm now looking at because that was really just more by chance mm -hmm. and out of practice that, uh, you know, sort of just an, an individual thing that, that I had done as opposed to uh, some formal mechanism, but it has highlighted us for the need, need to do that and their placement director um, and certainly for the, in the team we have that people Know, check into each other and stuff like that, and there's that whole process. But we recognize for people that are observers that come along and our students that come out that uh, we do need to have more of a rigorous process. In our current system, it's it's there. Our and most of our students that come with us come from a their medical students that take a year off and do a bachelor's of science in pre-hospital care, and they're sort of part of a, a cohort um, and a group. So we and we have a link with them in the university. So we have a whole mechanism for checking in with them and whatnot, but in Essex and Hearts, where it was at the time, they don't have that formal structure with something they're putting in the place. Um, any other questions uh, from online or, or the different sites? Hi, Mike. It's Joe Acker from uh, Kelowna. Another great presentation. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, you made some great recommendations of ways that we can deal with building some resilience um, kind of on the job. And you mentioned earlier in the presentation that your partner recognized that you were experiencing burnout. Can you give us mm -hmm. some suggestions on how, as paramedics, emergency physicians, we can, um, I guess, work with our family members, whether it's our partners or our families or our friends, uh, to deal with some of these things at home, people who aren't in the medical profession? Yeah, I think that's... And I'm probably not the best person to talk about it because it hasn't been the um, the thing I've done the best. My husband, uh, uh, you know, as I he won't be afraid of me to say, uh, paints the sight of blood on TV. So uh, not the person who I ever bring these things home to and stuff, or didn't in the past, and was reluctant to. Um, I have started to change that, and I, I do talk more now, um, certainly than I ever used to, about. Uh, so just that if you know there's been a difficult job or a difficult um, difficult day kind of thing, without going into the details of the actual job, um, and you know I think it's been for me more of an education, and also working with colleagues and and um, introducing you know sort of bringing my my partner into my life at work to a degree in terms of our socializing, socializing, inviting him along to socialize when we socialize with my colleagues. So I think it's a little bit of seeing us together and understanding and hearing from other people sort of gives them a better sense of what it is like that we go through. I think uh, in the military side of it, there is there is uh, good supports for family and before deployments and things like that. Spent a lot of time and made sure that he was connected with the Family Resource Center. Oops, oh, that's my computer. Um, and uh, so I think I took some lessons and, and learned a little bit from my colleagues in the military about about how to do this, um, and uh, I think the whole issue of going on deployments and and uh, they, um, especially my colleagues, have been in the military a lot longer than I had, um, and had maintained successful relationships. I 
listen to them and, and learn from them the tools and techniques about how to do it. But I think there's things that we can take away from that. And, uh, and I think one of the things that's a little bit different is for if you're a doctor, a nurse, or a paramedic, is that it's just, for family members, I think they sometimes just see us as, as our job, it's just our day job, and, and it's not, it's different than the military where it's like, oh, you're going off to a war zone, and they recognize that that, oh, yeah, that, that might be an issue. Um, you may see some things that are, that are that are more overwhelming. I think a lot of times our family members don't necessarily always appreciate just what every day at work is like in some of our jobs, and uh, I think it's just sharing that and being willing to, um, to to have those conversations so they have an understanding. And I think some organizations do a good job of that too, with uh, providing information for families about what these roles are like and stuff for their, their loved one. Thanks for that. That's, that's great. Question that has been messaged to me uh, from online is um, the research that BC paramedics uh, had very low self-esteem, but that is now seen to be one of the key elements of resilience. Can you comment on how you use self-compassion or how you inspire that in colleagues? Um, yeah, I think uh, so self-compassion um, I think is uh, again something I'm still learning <laughs> and probably something that a lot of us aren't, aren't, aren't good at. The self-esteem thing, I'm certainly much better at taking care of those around me than I, have, than I have been of taking care of myself. Um, and I think a bit of it is, you know, I, I spend a lot more time with colleagues and people I work with ensuring that I point out for them their successes and taking the time to make sure that, that they're aware of it and, and their strengths and, and whatnot. I think a lot of it comes down to aspects of leadership. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in sort of intent-based leadership models and leader leaders where you know you, you create people in the organization, you empower them to have decision making and be leaders themselves so that they take ownership of the problem but they also um, have the, the ability to, to to address those issues and, and I think that is, is key to to developing a, a team and a culture that's that's resilient and that people have that um, as uh, um, uh, David Marquette who's one of my favorite authors on this dis discusses the they calls them in, the emancipation to be able to have uh, um, a sense of self worth and, and that value of your job and stuff uh, is all important. There's a lot of good things in that Mayo Clinic article around how to help uh, people have value in their work, and I think that's key for self esteem as well. Um, any other questions from the different sites or or online? Okay, so we have 15 minutes. You can feel free to pop off, but yeah. I'm, I'm going to... Before people pop off, oh, yeah, what do you do to this uh, process here is I'm just going to do the RSVP roll call. Uh, so just bear with me for a few minutes. Um, so if I say your name, if you could just unmute the mic quickly and give a yes. Um, I'll just start with the different site RSVPs. So uh, Victoria General, uh, are Mackenzie and Ron both there? Is that a yes? Okay. Moving on to Kelowna, is there Chance online? Okay. Moving on to the Royal Columbia Hospital, is there Steve Stone? I'm here. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Surrey Memorial, uh, Jolene, Stephen, and Jackie? Are here. Yep, all three. Uh, moving on to Prince George, is Alexandra there? Quick, yeah. All right, moving on to Kamloops, uh, Steve and Justin? Moving on to uh, the online, uh, is there Patrice? Okay. Moving on to, so we'll just go down uh, the online. So is there Anthony Forez? Fures? Okay. 
Steve Baker. Karen Moore. Jan Falkowski. Michael Bateman. Paul Albert. Samantha Scott. Paul Curtis. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Christine Bell. Okay. Ivan Hayward. Uh, David Melrose. Andrew, oh, David Melrose, was that a yes? Yes. Okay. Is there Bev Hodgson? Was that a yes for Bev Hodgson? Uh, Robert Parkinson? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, Andrew Kuchta. Miranda T. Sorry, Justin Powell is here, just having some tech issues. Sure, great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Miranda, Miranda Tide or Miranda T. Uh, Matt Kress, is that a yes for Matt Kress? Sandra Frank, uh, Melanie Stevens. Amanda Simcha. It's Robert Parkinson here. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I hear you, Robert. I brought you down. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm just going through the chat room. I wanted to advise. There's a lot of people that are saying they're here in the chat room, but their mics aren't coming through to you. So I think that uh, okay. uh, people are having problems. Sure. Could you, would you be able to compile a list of the chat room or screenshot that and send it to me? I'll do my best, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Tom Ratcliffe. I can see Tom Ratcliffe online. He does has no mic. And then Callum Elsden McLeod. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, you can have shelter permission in attendance as well. Yeah. Uh, say that again, sorry? Uh, Mikael right. Sheldrum. Okay. It's, oh, yeah, uh, I got you. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you also add Lucy and Gerard online as well, please? Okay. Yeah, Along I see that. Line. I do see that, yeah. yeah. And Chris Bustamante. Okay. B-U-S-T-A-M-A-N-T-E. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, so, uh, and then, uh, Mike, you had mentioned uh, you'll send video links for me to send out to people, is that correct? Yeah, I'll send you the yeah. YouTube links if you want to stick around 15 minutes, I'll play them there, but, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, but for those who have to run, uh, we'll send the, the YouTube links out for this. So thank you again for the opportunity and the time, thank and you. thank you. Now you can actually watch Matt's much, Matt's much more professional work than a Sure. That's great. Oops, the wrong one. And if someone could just mute their mic, who has a dog in the background? Oh, I'm not going to grasp the dog here. No. <laughs> Did you get Guy Hicken? Hi, honey.
Thank you. Being in healthcare for Thank you. 30 some odd years now, there are a few jobs and patients over that time that stand out as particularly striking sort of cases that you'll never forget. This will definitely go down as one of them. Even if you know you're going to work in the pre-hospital environment, you know that you're going to go out and see sick patients. There are some patients that you just, you can never prepare yourself for and, and emotionally it's, it's actually very difficult sometimes. I was an observer working with the doctor and the paramedic. I was just shocked. It was something that I wasn't expecting. Hello, Abe. Hi, Tony. Okay, yeah, just pass details. Another one's just come in. Um, okay. We've got a possible dead child, severe traumatic injuries. Sorry. Uh, okay, okay, cool. We're calling lifting. Thanks. The first thing that went through my mind, particularly when I heard the mechanism of injury, was not again, because it was only just over a month since, since the last similar call I had. I talked to Mike as we were putting our helmets on and told him that I'd never seen anything like that before. I was quite nervous, to be honest. I think any incident that involves a child is, is hugely stressful. The language that she used was dead child opposed to something like traumatic cardiac arrest. And the adrenaline just goes Sorry to up. interrupt, but can you hear Victoria? Yeah. We get tasked on the most can serious jobs. Each one of these jobs can Okay, Ron Bass, Hal Milton, and Bev Eboy are here. We just sent an email to be in your head sometimes, several times before you get to earlier. some of the procedures you might have to do. We know that this was a very young child as well, which adds additional pressure. The most time critical of any patient that we will ever have. You want to get to the patient as quickly as possible. medical students, but I think I really needed it at the time. I think there's a learning side, but I also really feel that there's a well-being pastoral type side. That's right. Mm -hmm. Start from the beginning, so job came in. And it's also the time to start the preparations for what might come next, the beginning of that sort of process of, of getting through these bad jobs. I think that really hit me hard in the way that it was passed. Just before we were leaving, I got Mike uh, and asked him, what do I do now? What does anyone do, really, after that? What do you do on that night? I think when you go home, everybody handles it differently. I recognize some of the things that he may face, you know, potentially having memories come back or intrusive thoughts or even flashbacks. Okay, oxygen. in there. Suction. Okay, we'll check. Suction. All right. Let's go. I think one of the most important things is to let people know what normal is, letting them know that's normal and it gets better over time. And I think that's one of the most worrisome things to people when they first experience this, that they don't expect that. During the actual incident, I think there was so many things that needed to be done. 
I don't think I necessarily had time for all of that, that emotion. But I thought about it a lot, actually, after the day that it occurred. The scene itself was very visually distressing, um, and it, it was it was horrible to see. I had some dreams, I suppose, nightmares, or however you want to word them. Some of them were, were months later and rather than saying to my family who were all around, I'm just, you know, finding this a little bit difficult, I just kind of held it in. I thought about it a lot in the week after, when I was in the supermarket, seeing other children would remind me of it. And when it does come back, sometimes it's overwhelming. That was, would have been quite a scary thing had Mike not told me that it was normal and that it wasn't something to be worried about and he experienced it too. So a few months after the job, because I was still on occasion thinking about it and having the odds or experience for it come back, I thought I should just drop Matt a text and see how he's doing, providing the opportunity to talk about this if he wanted to. I think because we move between lots of different teams, often we can just slip through the net especially for medical students such as myself where we don't know if what we're experiencing is normal and we also don't really know who to talk to either and actually the week that Mike had texted me I had been thinking about it quite a lot though the thoughts became less sometimes I would just be surprised when I was with my nieces at Christmas we'd just be doing something and they would be messing around and then suddenly that thought would come back to me and I'd be right back there in the situation. Alright, let's uh, set up for a call to Can we get an IO in please? Reception. When you're in the home of the patient and you can see the relatives, you can see exactly who's child they are and how devastated the family is to, to be in this situation. To be able to share my experience with Mike made me feel less alone. We have to share and talk about these and that if you aren't impacted by the death of a child, especially as a healthcare worker, are you really the type of person who cares and, and should be in this job because you're not human if this doesn't bother you. Here at Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance, I think we are a very open organisation and I think we are good at talking to each other about our feelings. But I think sometimes you just hold these things in. But actually that meant that I just became a bit more anxious. You know, I was trying to cover it up almost um, and that was a bit, of a, a bit of a mistake on my behalf. I think there is always this feeling that you, know, you don't talk about these things or people feeling that if you experience this, that you're weak or vulnerable, so people man up or be macho and don't want to ever talk about these issues. From the outside, a lot of times it looks like people who deal with all this can just walk away and, and not be bothered by it. You just see them smiling and you don't really know what's below the surface. So the Minds Matter conference was really aimed at highlighting some of the psychological impacts of trauma both on patients as well as on providers and responders. And that's really all we're going to tell you about the case. And this is a little bit unusual uh, in that typically we focus on the clinical side of things, but the case this time is actually us. I didn't really talk to anyone about my feelings and emotions for, for months actually in, until it came up at the Minds Matter conference. And that's the first time I spoke to both Tony and Matt again. We started discussing our experiences and I was actually really surprised. And it was only then that I realised that Mike and Matt had been feeling some of the very similar emotions that I'd had. Some of them had had flashbacks, times where they felt quite emotional. But actually we'd never, we never spoke about it to each other. We'd, we'd just kind of carried on as it were. And if we'd have just bridged the gap together, then it would have been a lot of comfort to both of us. 
it was really useful to see that there were other more experienced clinicians, people who were excellent at their jobs, also struggling with these kind of emotions and experiencing the same things. Sharing that with others, particularly junior doctors, medical students, and training paramedics is really important. The education that Mike gave me early on was completely invaluable because through the entire period of remembering the events, I felt like that was all very normal and I didn't feel isolated. All of these things, the anxiety, the flashbacks, sometimes not being able to sleep, etc., that they're all a completely normal response to a terrible and tragic incident. We're finally coming to terms with the understanding of the impact that it has. Every contact leaves a trace. A lot of people are experiencing difficulties, but it's just talking about it that's going to make all of the difference. Share your feelings and emotions in the weeks, months, and even longer following the incident. And if you're struggling, if you're finding things different, talk to your colleagues, talk to your peers, talk to your family, talk to your friends, and they will listen and they will help you. Sorry, just from Victoria, a question I wanted to ask earlier. Yep. Uh, so the statistic that you said about the uh, mental health reporting essentially quintupling in seven or eight years, do you think that's more uh, people are getting um, exposed to mental health, or do you think that's just the stigma dropping mm -hmm. slowly? Yeah, I think that's a, a UK stat and university students. It, there's a lot of discussion in, in sort of the, uh, the field about why that's happening. It's probably a combination of multiple things. One is, you know, which I said there's a good side to it, which may be people's accessing care and, and less stigma, which is, which is potentially very helpful. But there does, in terms of reading some of the things around this, seem to be a, a also a component that there is a higher rate of, of um, stress and, and some and, uh, mental health conditions amongst sort of uh, that uh, our younger teenage and early um, sort of younger population than there has been previously in addition to the whole reporting effect and stuff. And that's when the whole discussions around coming into social media and other things, what's causing this, why is it happening, but uh, um, you know our lives are, are certainly different now than they were 20, 30, 50 years ago in terms of, uh, uh, of what people experience at different stages of their life. Thank you. All right, so I'll play the last one. This one's only uh, five minutes long. As volunteers in that environment, we are challenged. You are putting your life at risk. When that incident happened, it was the first time I'd been out working my search dog. We got an early morning call to um, help with a missing walker, missing overnight. We were tasked to start searching on the hill. The snow was very deep in part and it was hard going. And then we came across a huge avalanche, an absolutely massive avalanche. And that was the first time I'd seen an avalanche. I, I saw my dog working across and then she stopped and started scrabbling in the snow and digging the snow and when she came back and indicated and led me there, I realized that she'd found what looked like a glove lying in the snow. Um, but you, you don't want to put my hand on that. There was clearly a hand inside the glove and um, at that point we realized we'd found the, the missing person. casualty had been evacuated by helicopter down to a doctor so as we were coming off the hill we realized that the casualty had in fact uh, lost their life but a lot of things didn't really occur to me at that time you know you were so involved in that incident and there's a lot of mix you've obviously got a, a sadness to, at the outcome and then the other side of it is that the sort of excitement and exhilaration of of your dog having made a find you know we, we train for two to three years 
to get our dogs to that point. Um, and I suppose after that, everything was quite busy. I went home and then tried to, you know, explain the situation to the family. But again, you know, they weren't there. So you're trying to describe something that they couldn't really get their heads around. And I, I suppose I was taken by surprise a little bit that night when I woke up in the middle of the night and the, the duvet was over my head and I imagined I was actually getting buried in, in the snow. It was almost like a, a, a nightmare reliving. And, and I suppose that was the first thing that then just struck me as like, wow, this is, this is something different that I've never experienced. And then the next day, you know, I was trying to deal with that, but also then started realizing I was having a lot of thoughts about you know, did we do the right thing? Was was the person alive at, at the time? You know, could we have done more? Getting reassurance from one of my teammates that there was actually nothing more we could have done. You know, what I had done on the day was the best I could have done. It made a huge difference. But the one thing I couldn't get rid of from that was the mix of images that were in, in the head and the surprise. No one had ever told us about these sort of things. Um, I didn't realize these were normal reactions to an event like that. The sleep challenges, um, perhaps the guilt, some of the physical things, your body and muscles and headaches and, and stomach upsets. They're your body's natural responses to either fight or, or flight. And there are things that you can do to help that. And, and that was really useful and it was very helpful. Subsequently, on another occasion, I was out working on my own and so there is a higher risk that you will come across something unexpected. And so that image will always be with you uh, and you then have to deal with that. But it helped that I knew what to expect. It helped that I was able to speak about it. Um, and, and it didn't matter that the people I spoke to hadn't been involved. They were just there to listen and that made a big difference. You know, we have to deal with quite a number of traumatic events. Uh, looking back over the years, what I've realized is that just because a particular incident hasn't had a, a major impact on me, doesn't mean that it hasn't had an impact on someone else in the team. So I think it's really important that within teams we develop a culture where it's okay to say that you would like to speak about it, or it's okay to ask somebody and talk to them about it. Showing care to somebody uh, and giving them the opportunity to talk makes a huge difference. And I think it's really important that that sort of information gets passed to as many people in, in teams as possible. The reactions you will have are normal. They, they are things that will just happen. And if you know that, then you'll be able to understand and help yourself. They can be fixed and they will go away in all but the most extreme circumstances. And there is professional help for that. Raise your own awareness, realize they're normal, and speak to people. Thanks, that's great. That's yeah, and thank you again uh, to Dr. Mike Christian. Um, thank you all for joining in. Um, and our next rounds will be on November 22nd, where we will have another guest speaker. So uh, we hope to see you then. Um, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you from Victoria. <laughs>